like to call this hearing of the Subcommittee on Strategic Forces to order. We have a full morning ahead of us on an increasingly important subject of uh, ballistic and missile defense. Uh, we'll start with this uh, open hearing, and then we will uh, adjourn and move to the H the Hask skiff for a closed session uh, with the witnesses to finish discussing things that aren't appropriate to talk about in open hearing. Uh, we have an esteemed panel with us today uh, to discuss the missile defense threat that the U.S. Uh, has to respond to. Uh, we have Mr. Brian McCune, Principal Deputy of Undersecretary for Defense uh, Policy uh, from the Department of Defense. We have Admiral Bill Gortney, uh, U.S. Navy Commander, uh, North American Aerospace Defense Command and the U.S. Northern Command, Vice Admiral Jim Searing, U.S. Navy Director, the Missile Defense Agency, and Lieutenant General David Mann, Commander, Joint Functional Component Command for Integrated Missile Defense. Uh, given the packed morning, I'm going to ask the witnesses to summarize their prepared statements in three minutes. Your full statement will be uh, uh, submitted to the record. I want to make a couple of quick comments, and then we'll yield to my good friend uh, from Tennessee uh, for any statement he wants voluntarily cut over $500 billion out of the Defense Department, just to show our recognition of the financial uh, burden that this country was suffering. And then we, we had no idea there would be another $600 billion coming behind it the very next year. And it's that those two things together is what, has what, is what really has created this mess that we're in. But while the members of this committee, the full HASC, as well as this subcommittee, I think, all are fully aware of the implications of these continued irresponsible cuts, I think it's important for you all uh, as uh, service members to help describe for the members who are on this committee who will be reading about this hearing uh, exactly what these cuts mean to your ability to continue to defend this country in an effective way. So with that, General Mann, I'll start with you. Tell us uh, what you think it means to you, not just in this FY16 budget, because the truth is you all have done a pretty good job up to now dealing with these cuts and keeping your uh, straight face. It's time to start telling us what it means. So I'll start with you. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I, think, uh, I think we have to recognize that the threat is not standing still. We see a threat that, like I said in my statement, is, uh, is uh, growing both in terms of the sophistication of their weapon systems as well as the numbers. So in that context, uh, the concern that we have is that a lot of our, our programs in terms of the modernization of the Patriot Force, uh, the improvements to the radar, uh, the uh, missile enhancement segment uh, uh, that we're trying to develop to give us that uh, to bridge that gap between the Patriot and the THAAD force. Uh, the software upgrades that are required, those programs uh, due to sequestration could be impacted. They could be delayed. And again, the threat is not standing still. Also, in terms of homeland defense. Before, before you go further, that 12,000 foot altitude gap between the Patriot and the THAAD, mm -hmm. what, does that, what vulnerability does that create for us? What threat do we have to worry about penetrating that gap? In terms of uh, looking at uh, the uh, CENTCOM area of operations, uh, there are early release munitions uh, that could be employed within that range that could impact our operations uh, as far as uh, putting munitions on airfields, ports of entry. So that, that's, a, that's a critical gap that we need that missile uh, enhancement uh, to, to cover that gap that I talked about. Yep. So again, in terms of the regional support, the modernization efforts, also we have a lot of efforts underway to get after the cruise missile threat that I'm sure will be discussed later on today. Uh, the uh, indirect fire protection capability utilizing the AIM-9X uh, AIM missile will help us uh, address that threat. Patriot does have a capability against, uh, against cruise missiles, but we need to enhance that capability. So those efforts. And most importantly, the Army's uh, number one air missile defense uh, priority is the network, uh, the, the air missile defense battle see, command I network. I see going on with North Korea very specifically, and the pace and the progress that they're making, I'm in serious jeopardy of, uh, without those improvements of going to the NORTHCOM commander and advising him that the system is overmatched. That would be the path that we're on if we don't do these improvements between now and 2020. The system will be overmatched. Well, as I said before, the biggest impact is the delay 
the delay of capability for our ability to outpace the threats, and Admiral Searing just adequately uh, very well explained those particular impacts. So let me take another, uh, another look. Let me, let me mention this from a different way. Defending the homeland is, is an away game. That's where our primary focus is, is to delay the away game. And the way sequestration is going to impact the services, they're going to have to go into their readiness counts in order to do that, which is a, the quickest path to a hollow force. That is going to drive these uh, low-density, high-demand assets, be them Patriot Thad or, or Aegis BMD ships. Their operational tempo is going to go up, only stressing a very, very stressed force as it is. And the Navy, in my last job as the <coughs> force provider for the Navy, you know, those carriers and air wings, amphibious ready groups and marine expeditionary units and ballistic missile defense ships are the highest op tempo that we have. And those are the forces that are going to feel that impact that's going to directly affect uh, how well we uh, defend ourselves in the away game. Every commander's first responsibility is to defend the people, is to protect the people that, are, that, they, that work for them. And having lived with my family underneath the Iranian threat in Bahrain for a couple of years, you know, I'm very, very concerned of, of, of that ability to outpace the threat in the Pacific and in the, in, and in the, uh, and in the Gulf and in the Mediterranean in order to do that critical mission. That's how right, sequestration. Left right of launch. How do, we, how do we move this into advanced technology and get, and get on the right, right side of the cost curve, in his words? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Or, yeah, Mr. McKeon. The only thing I'd add, Mr. Cooper, is underlying this memo from those uh, two officers is uh, as a tension that we see and sequestration is also a factor in this both the one we've already experienced and the one that's looming over us even though we don't have over 100,000 forces forward deployed right now uh, there's still so stress on some of the force the COCOM still have requirements that they need to meet near-term threats and balance against that the secretary the chairman the service chiefs, they're all trying to bring the forces back to full spectrum readiness uh, to get the forces healthy. So that, it's a tension that's ongoing all the time, the demand for forces from the COCOMs against needing to uh, enhance readiness. And I think that's what underlies some of the appeal in that memo. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I recognize the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Franks, for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank all of you for your gallant service to the country. Um, Admiral Searing included in the FY16 budget, budget request for, from the President, uh, there was multi-year uh, procurement authority for the SM31B in that. And can you speak to that for the record uh, as to the importance of the authorization? Yes, sir. Given, given design stability of that missile and the successes that we've had uh, with intercept and where the predicted reliability is of that missile, uh, we, we are pushing a multi-year certification authority through the department to send over here to request multi-year procurement authorization. We, we estimate it will be a 14 percent savings over annual procurements, and we view that as a, as, a, uh, as a good deal for the American taxpayer and the right thing to do. Yes, sir. Uh, you're Longer term, we, we and the Air Force and other partners need to think through, you know, what is the partnership opportunities for a space base uh, application in terms of the real persistence and the real discrimination capability that will, that will come from space. You've heard me say, Mr. Lamborn, it's, you can't just do it all with radars. We've got to get up to space and have, have that uh, constellation presence over the threat from, from the West and the East, and, and you're going to see more thinking from us and our partners on that in future budgets. Well, that's very encouraging, uh, but also uh, I'd let me ask you about something we have talked about uh, in, a, in my office privately, but directed energy. Um, that's something, there's a bipartisan agreement that, that has tremendous potential for the future, and is and should be part of our asymmetrical advantage as a country over people on the other side. So uh, what are you doing to apply the benefits of directed energy? Sir, there, there's, there's two applications, obviously tracking in terms of what that might provide from a space-based solution uh, with laser capability and, and the maturation of that technology. The other very important part of, of that technology maturation effort is what what it may mean for us scaling up to a boost phase intercept capability. 
and two very promising development efforts ongoing with MIT and Livermore. Both have advantages and disadvantages. Uh, we've gone out to industry and asked their ideas in terms of how can we get technology to a demonstration sooner than later, and I think you'll see us pursue that, uh, that path for, uh, for really a down-select in the 2018 time period to single up on, on one technology and one solution for uh, tracking, and I'll just leave it at tracking in this forum, and, and, um, and boost phase intercept. Okay. Thank you. And, and lastly, Admiral Gortney, I'll, I'll finish up by asking you about the cruise missile threat. And, and I know on all these things we can get into more of the weeds in classified session, but in general terms, what are, what's the threat that we're looking at against the homeland today? The only nation that has a, an effective cruise missile capability is, is Russia. Uh, from uh, either their long-range aviation, their bear, bear H's, um, other from their cruise missile submarines, or they have an ability to put it on surface ships, both combatants and non-combatants. Um, uh, having uh, been in the cruise missile business defending against them since I was a JG, and I've shot over 1,300 of them, I know that they're very effective and they're very difficult to shoot down. And our current strategy is very focused on shooting the arrows, and we need to expand our strategy and our capabilities to be able to get the archer. Um, hold the archer at risk, uh, have the, and there's an approach, rules of engagement, that allows us to take the archer out and then be able to deal with the leakers that come through here, and that's where we're trying to get the program. Well, thank you again for the work that you do. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Chair, I recognize the gentleman.